Let me begin by expressing again to all those who preached in my place while I was away. My wife and I were over in England. I think there is still a good work going on, and we have been able to contact even other of the brethren there that we hope we can work with as time allows. This year's lectureship had to do with fellowship. You might think about lectureship and fellowship, and it may help you start to think a little bit about uh, why we put such a thing as ship on the end of lectureship, fellowship, eldership. There's a reason it's there. But in the process of discussing fellowship, then, of course, we answered a number of questions from a number of the brethren. I remember, as I hold right there, many years ago, over 40, the late Brother Thomas Warren bringing an excellent series of lessons on what the Bible teaches concerning fellowship. And he emphasized in that series of lessons what still needs to be emphasized, and that is there's just probably not enough understanding among the brethren regarding all of what the Bible teaches on fellowship. Now, he made that statement, and I can make it the same way, and for the same reasons he made it. If you go back to the beginning of the 19th century when people were trying to come out of human churches governed by the commandments and doctrines of men in catechisms and prayer books and manuals and disciplines, then the first great effort was, how is it that we can all, since we believe in God the Father and Christ the Son and our need of salvation and Christ is the only Savior and the Bible is the Word of God, how is it then that there's this kind of Christian, that kind of Christian, and another kind of Christian when the Bible speaks of no such thing? Silent. Thinking people begin to say, well, there's something not right. I mean, it's the same God we all worship. It's the same Lord we all look to to save us. It's the same Bible that reveals it all to us. How is it that we're divided? How is it we are not in fellowship? Well, they begin to conclude it's because, first of all, assuming everybody has the right disposition of mind or attitude toward God, that it must be we don't have the right standard. How is it that we can have the one Bible, the one revelation of God, and that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, and that means spiritually complete, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that it's also called the perfect or the complete law of liberty, which God says if you continue in it, you'll be blessed in the actions that you carry out. How is it then that everybody acknowledges this Bible is the Word of God? And of course he says everybody. By that he means those who uh, believe in uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the need of salvation from sin and becoming Christians and that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, that no man comes to the Father but by Him as He said in John 14, 6. How is it we're divided? So the first thing they said was, well, we're going to have to get back to where we all have the same standard to govern us. And that since we all have the Bible, we acknowledge it to be the Bible, but we're all divided, where's the problem? And they started thinking, well, we've got this particular uh, man-made book, and it's saying that if you're a Presbyterian, then you've got to believe and do this. And they were real strict on those things in those days. Or if you're a Methodist, then you follow the Methodist discipline, the Methodist teaching, and it's peculiar and sets you apart from every other church and makes you a Methodist or a Baptist or whatever. So if we get rid of those councils that set up those disciplines and manuals and prayer books and catechism for each one of these particular churches that keep us all separated, then we'll be on the right track. And that was the beginning. And if you've ever studied that early effort to be Christians and Christians only, and the only Christians, then you'll see that's what they decided. Because if you don't have the right standard, or if people have different standards, there's no telling which way you will go. 
That focused them then on the passages in both the Old Testament and New Testament, but especially the New Testament, that talked about being one. Thus they concluded that before we can fellowship one another as the Bible defines and uses that word fellowship, we're going to have to all agree upon what is the truth of God's will concerning salvation and the church and Christian living. Again, it's centered on that truth is the Bible rightly divided, and especially the New Testament of Jesus Christ. They knew he said he had built his church, and they begin to say then, well, it must be then that the one church of our Lord is not made up of all these differing churches and factions. That's foreign to what anybody can read in the New Testament. So we can't support that any longer. Oh, it, it caused a great stir in the first 20, 25 years, 30 years of the 19th century among people who said, well, the Bible and the Bible only is all we're going to appeal to as our rule of faith and practice from God. Well, questions began to arise in people's minds. One man said, well, if that's the case, then we'll have to give up infant baptism because we can't read of that in the Bible. And how can we do that? And in a great discussion at somebody's house, the fellow almost began to cry. And some other brother spoke up and simply said, if it's not in the Bible, we need to give it up. And it was that resolve of honesty of heart that began to cause people to see well, are we practicing what Jesus in the New Testament teaches us to practice? It caused them to even get more particular on seeing from a study of the Bible itself just how it properly divides itself. Because they knew Paul had commanded Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word truth. They knew that when they read the New Testament, all of it written in the New Testament, or in the, in the first century, that Jesus had prayed for unity, that they be one even as His Father and uh, Jesus are one. And they knew it was to cause the world to believe, that is, this oneness or unity. So here's authority, here's unity, here's fellowship. They're all hooked together. You can't study one without the other. And thus they understood that unity and the fellowship that we've mentioned couldn't exist unless they were all under the one head of Christ who manifested His will in His last will and testament. And that appealed to their common sense too because that's exactly how they would operate if they wrote their last will and testament in view of the fact someday they wouldn't be here and they wanted whatever they left behind to be distributed according to their will. So they begin to do this kind of thing. In fact, when uh, Campbell preached early on what was called his Sermon on the Law. It was a revolutionary sermon. It doesn't impact those of us who study the Bible today in the Lord's Church, at least most of us, I say, who study the Bible, as it did the people at that time. Because people then do just what denominations do they. They don't make any distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Campbell says, if you're going to understand the way that Christ saves you, you not only have got to take this book as the one inspired will of God, you've got to realize that it divides itself appropriately and that God's given it for our study and we can figure out how it ought to be divided to get the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, on whatever it is that pertains to our salvation. And it was very revolutionary. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I suggest that you study the history of the early efforts of men in the 19th, late 18th century to produce pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity. Not because you have to know it to go to heaven. I don't believe that at all. I don't think you have to read any of Campbell's works or Martin Warren Stone or any of those people that were champions in that day and time in order to learn the plan of salvation from God's Word and go to heaven. But I do think it assists you in understanding how men did come out of what was basically a denominational world without any concept of what we're talking about. The church is just one church made up of all the denominations and you're saved by Christ and you pick which denomination you want to be a part of and everybody uh, does what they want to do. No, they realized different from that and they knew if they would have fellowship one with another, there's going to have to be the right authority to appeal to to determine number one, how do you become a Christian? At what point do you become a Christian? What's involved in becoming a Christian? What does the word Christian mean? 
Where are Christians located? And so they began that effort. It went over many, many years. And if you read that history, you will see how they struggled to come out of denominational sectarian, basically Protestant denominationalism. None of those words are found in the scriptures. The Lord's church had never described such a thing. They could read the Bible and know that. So they said everybody ought to have a Bible and everybody ought to be studying it every day. That's how you're going to learn God's will. And guess what? In that time in the United States history, if there was any book in any home on the frontier or anywhere else, it was the Bible. And it was read no matter what church they were a part of, if they were religious at all, say maybe Roman Catholics. And what's very interesting is that there never has been a Christian where the Word of God has not gone. Which says then we must go back to what the Bible says, learn how to study it. If we're to have, here it begins, fellowship with God. When we study fellowship as to who among humans we can engage in fellowship. First of all, there must be the vertical fellowship between the saved human and God. There's where it begins. And that demands that you know the truth of God concerning how one is saved from sins, at what point that happens. Because when it happens, you become a Christian, Christian meaning of Christ. And you're in fellowship with God. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that a child of God, a member of the Lord's church, is to be in spiritual fellowship with anybody else that is not in fellowship with God. It's just not there. Now, what about the word fellowship? Well, the Greek words basically call, uh, are known as koinonia, and it means something we share together because we are of one mind and one judgment. A great example of that word itself is found in Acts chapter 2, which is the record of the inspired Luke of the beginning of the Lord's church in Jerusalem. On that first Pentecost of our Lord, at the new calendar's right, about A.D. 30, was known as 33, there's been some adjustments to the calendar, and so A.D. 33 or A.D. 30. And here's what we have. After the Gospels preached, before Peter, is that's the sermon that's recorded among all the sermons preached by the other apostles, when he gets to the point of having proved that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that rather than receive him, the Jews had put him to death. In verse 37, the scripture says those folks, by that truth, were pricked in their heart, the inward man. They were guilty. They were honest, and they acknowledged their guilt. And they said unto Peter, but not Peter only, the scripture says unto the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, they're already believers on the basis of the word, proving that so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, as believers, Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Being Jews, uh, having lived faithful to God under the law of Moses, he makes it clear, for the promise is unto you and to your children, children of those who hear me now, as he would say it at that time, and to all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And he's talking about the gospel call, the call of God to men to be saved by Christ through the gospel, which Paul later says is God's power to save, Romans 1 and verse 16. That's why it must be preached to every creature. It's his power to save. And if it's his power to save, then you have to be exposed to it. And the charge given of Christ is to the church to preach the gospel to every creature. All right. There were other words, many other words, according to Luke, whereby uh, Peter and the others testified and exhorted. That means now you admitted you know the truth, you've been educated, and act upon that as to your duty. That's what exhortation means. Because he says, saying, save yourselves. You have an obligation. You have a duty to be saved by the grace of God extended to you through the gospel terms of salvation, which we've already seen given in Acts 37 and 38, to 37 and 38. So in many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves this untoward or crooked generation. Now verse 41 gets interesting. Then they that gladly received his word. You know, you can receive the word, but not receive it gladly. 
If you go a little, a little later over in the book of Acts, Luke will tell you about where Stephen stood up and preached and they could not refute what he said. And they received the word, but it wasn't gladly. They killed him for preaching the truth that would save their soul. But these gladly received it. And what did they do when they gladly received it? In view of, as believers, they cried out, Men, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent as believers, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for unto, in order to, that's the point, the remission or forgiveness of your sins, sins being the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, the only thing that can separate man from God. So you need to be forgiven. All right. He said, they that gladly received his word were baptized. They did what the Holy Spirit through Peter and the rest of the apostles told these believers to do after they had repented. They were baptized gladly. Everybody that's ever understood the gospel plan of salvation with an honest and good heart has done the same thing. If you're of an honest and good heart and you're instructed in the truth concerning how to become a Christian, you'll do just exactly what they did. If you're not, you won't. It's that simple. Now, that is right now. You may change later on if God gives you time to live. But anybody that gladly receives His word, the truth of the gospel concerning salvation, is going to be baptized for the reason given in verse 38. But now watch this. The same day they were added unto them, that's the apostles, about 3,000 souls. Well, there were 3,000 souls there that gladly received the word, at least. And... You see, that verse doesn't stop with the end of verse 41, even though it's the end of a sentence. And there's something else connected, in other words, to, this, to these people who gladly received the word and were baptized. They continued. To continue in something is to not stop it. There's no gaps in it. You just keep on doing it. So they continued, and emphasis is given. Steadfastly, they were determined to continue correctly. And what did they continue steadfastly in? The apostles' doctrine. Well, why so? Well, that causes us to have to realize that the apostles are the ambassadors of the court of heaven. What does that mean? They were chosen by the Lord to receive the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, whereby when he's no longer on this earth, but he's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high, as Peter declared him sitting at this time, ruling over his kingdom, the Lord's church, then somebody on this earth can continue to teach the truth that he taught while he was here. And as he promised in John chapters 14, 15, and 16 to the apostles, they would be guided into all truth. And infallibly they would remember what he taught and they would receive infallibly and set it down infallibly without any error the will of heaven. Now the church knew that or they wouldn't have continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's how we got the New Testament. So they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And what follows after you continue in the doctrine? It's what we said earlier. You've got to have the standard of authority that governs you and guides you and leads you and instructs you so you can all be of the same mind and the same judgment which Paul commanded the divided Corinthian church to be in and Jesus prayed for. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, John 17. So they continued in the apostles' doctrine and now they can have fellowship. And that's what it says. And fellowship, this sharing that is peculiar to Christians, brothers and sisters who are all in Christ. And how did they get there? By coming, first of all, into fellowship with God when they obeyed the gospel. And that's, the, that's what you find here. They wanted to know what to, be safe, to do to be saved from sin once they were convicted of sin by the preaching of the gospel. And the Bible says they were, were devout men. These were not reprobate people like put Jesus to death. These are Jews who are doing their best to have an honest heart to keep the law God gave them. That's why they're there on this feast day anyway. Because God authorized it. But they find out because of the sermon that they were still sinners though they were devoted men. And that's the same word that describes Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 when it talks about him being devout. So here is a place where devout religious people needed to change. I don't cause some people to stop and think that you can be a devoted, honest, sincere person who thinks that God, and rightly so, is uh, the Father, the giver of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us enough to give Him, and Him you acknowledge as the Son of God, and yet 
devoted to that, you still may not be right with your God because you may not have obeyed the plan of salvation. These folks, as believers, were told to repent. They were baptized. And as devout people who realized their lost condition, they glad to receive the word were baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And in fellowship. And in breaking of bread. And in prayers. And notice what happened in this transition, in this transformation. And fear came upon every soul. You know, right, uh, there's a right fear and a bad fear. This is the proper, awesome respect for God and what it means to be God and how it affects us as humans. It's the kind of respect that you see in that great apostle of love, the apostle John, when you have him recording what transpired in the first chapter of the book of Revelation as he records that incident on the Isle of Patmos. And he's there exiled because of his faithful service to God. He's suffering persecution. And the Lord appears to him in a glorified state. And John said, Dad, you came over. Let's sit out at the table and have a cup of coffee. The Bible says when it gets through, you see that when it gets through describing the glory there is of the Christ. John falls at his feet as one dead. Now this is the same John whom Jesus loved. And he walked with him for over three and a half years every day being instructed along with the other apostles. And yet now when the Lord appears in His glory, you can see the awesome type of fear that's in John to be in the presence of the glorified God. So that we need, and these folks experience that. And notice they're seeing the many wonders and signs that were done by the apostles, which were done to prove that what they taught was from heaven and not from men. Notice further description of fellowship. And all that believed were together and had all things common. In other words, because they were brothers and sisters in the great family of God enjoying being Christians, although they're not named that till you'll see later on if you read the book of Acts, the idea of having all things common has to do with we're glad to help anybody with what we've got if they have need. That's all it means. But that's a lot. And notice how far they were willing to go with that. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now again, that's showing the sharing, the aspect of koinonia. And notice, and they continuing daily with one accord. There's that one mind and one judgment. First of all, they're in one accord with the truth that they believed and obeyed, and they're in fellowship with God. There's that vertical fellowship. Now you're seeing described the horizontal fellowship. Everybody in fellowship with God through belief and obedience to the gospel, having been added to the church by the Lord and being baptized for the rest of sins, can now fellowship everybody else done the same thing who continues steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Okay, and they continued daily with one accord. Well, in the temple, they had no situations we have today. All sorts of people gathered in that monstrous building and the porches of it to have different classes, so they did the same thing. And notice in breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Again, emphasis in their daily activity of the oneness and the sharing that they had with one another. In verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And he's already described such as should be saved. Now, let's emphasize this fellowship again. We've established that this sharing spiritually is between God and man when man receives with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save his soul, and he submits to it as is described in Acts 2. And thus the Lord adds him to the church, that is, to everybody else that's of the same disposition of mind toward God and His Word and have complied with the same mandates of Prince Emmanuel to obtain the salvation. He and He alone offers as the way, the truth, and the life, knowing that no man comes to the Father but by Him. But I want to approach this from another direction. I mentioned the Greek word the Holy Spirit used koinonia, what it means and how it's described in inspired commentary form in these verses of Acts chapter 2 by Luke. But I think all of us have seen the great sailing ships either in picture, maybe you've even toured some that are around, or you've seen movies where they're in complete sail. Well, there were a whole lot of people on those ships to do the work necessary for them to sail. 
Sometimes you may have seen movies or read something that told about how many people really own those ships. Well, if you look in uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 5, Jesus Himself is called the captain of our salvation. He's the head. He's the authority, even as He declared before His ascension, all power authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. The book of Ephesians describes Him as the head of the church, as He is head of all things. So it is His Word is the authority. It's His gospel we preach. Brethren, listen, there is many gospels acceptable to God as there are lords acceptable to God. There are as many gospels acceptable to God as there are Bibles acceptable to God. That doesn't seem to be a problem in a lot of people's mind to say there's only one Lord. But they have a problem when the next thing comes up. One faith. There's only one system of faith going to save anybody. I sat down on the cube in uh, the underground subway, they called the tube, uh, going wherever we were going. Jody was sitting across from me, and Johnny Oxendine was standing there. We stood up for a while, as you do if you ride those things. If you've been to New York or somewhere, it's all the same boat. Or same tube, maybe I should say. <laughs> but here was a, a, a Sikh. You might know what a Sikh is. Well, he's of a certain persuasion from India. He wears the big turban and usually has the big beard. He's not Muslim. So I sat down beside him when the person got up. I don't know what made him ask this question, but we sat there a minute and the racket that's on all that. He turned and said, are you a Christian? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. What kind are you? Oh, what an opener. <laughs> I said, I'm just a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. He goes, <laughs> and then he starts to declare to me, after he pulls out a paper that was his, about the true religion of Christianity. Uh, I know we can't know some things are providential, but you think of the probability of that. <laughs> well, we had a little discussion. And a lot of what he was telling me on there was sure beat what a lot of folks know. But I asked him, I said, I thought you were, I thought you were a Sikh. You know what he said? He said, I am, but all that means is that we're students of the Scriptures. So we had a little talk. Couldn't talk about much because of the nature of the situation, but got his email and we'll see what happens. You never know who's out there. And you never know what you can do. And it doesn't guarantee because you can tell them the truth they're going to believe and obey it because all do not gladly receive the word. But nevertheless, you know, if he were to receive the same gospel preached here and from the heart obey it, the Lord would add him to the same church that he built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2, that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and 28. And you know, we will be brothers in the family of God. Because everybody that's in fellowship with God is in fellowship with every other faithful child of God. So the big ships you have a captain, you have his officers, you have all those people. Every one of them has a job. Rather, they are a ship of fellows. They all are involved in running the ship. Though their jobs may be different, they're all together. And they're under one head, the captain. And you know, we're on a ship. It's uh, the ship of Zion. And it's sailing from earth to heaven. And they're all under one captain, the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And it's by his will that we become Christians and thus in fellowship with God. And thus we should be in fellowship with everybody else in fellowship with God. Thus it behooves us to study the scriptures that we can see the identifying marks of a New Testament Christian because we do not want to be separated that is not in fellowship with all those who are in fellowship with God.
So I have authority as a child of God because I'm in fellowship with God, and I couldn't be a, a child of God if I wasn't, to be in fellowship with everybody else that's a child of God and faithfully serving God. Now, you've got that set out here. I want to show you something else that sometimes gets overlooked in the few minutes we have remaining. When you read the first epistle of John, in fact, all three of them, but especially the first one, he writes that because he wants the brethren to know about fellowship. Listen to how he does it. 1 John chapter 1, reading, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our, handle, our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, of course, he speaks of the apostles who experienced him in the flesh, that is, Christ. Then, parenthetically, the scripture says, For the life, that is, Christ's life, was manifested, made known, revealed, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Well, you know, there has to be a reason he's doing this. Well, here it is. Verse 3 tells us the reason. That we, or that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. And look here. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now we've already read Acts 2 at the beginning of the church. And we saw how those people came into fellowship with God. And the kind of fellowship they had with one another. That is among all those they knew and were associated with. They were in fellowship with God. And they're all in the Lord's church. And again, I say, if you say, well, I don't know how to find the Lord's church. or get with the enemy of the church. They've always been able to find it. And if the enemy of the church can find the church to persecute it, surely somebody who wants to serve God, study the Bible, learn the will of Christ, can identify it. And notice again, verse 4, And these things write we unto you. Uh, you know, that's saying he wrote it to you and to me, to everybody else. Because this is written to the church that's in the church. Now, there's a reason why that your joy may be full. God does not want us to say, well, boy, I, I died today. I'm going to hell. I am scared to death. He wants our joy to be full. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship, there it is, sharing with him, then there's a certain way you're going to live. And you've had that described in Acts 2. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, you know, the Bible doesn't mince words. It just says we lie. And do not the truth. Hey, the truth's doable. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And what's that going to lead to if you keep doing that? You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. No wonder Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them. Set them apart from the ways of the world. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all on suffering and doctrine. But he tells you something about people. And these are people that were in the church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, and there's the problem. Shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears? And what's going to happen when they do that? They'll be turned away from the truth. The truth unto fables. But John says if we say that we have fellowship, this coin here, this relationship, this ship of fellows where everybody's doing their part to make the ship of Zion go as God intended and walk in darkness contrary to the light of God, then we are lying if we are living that way and saying we're acceptable to God. And we do not the truth. What truth? Gospel truth. God's power to save us. But in contrast to that, what are we to do? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship, one with another. And what's happening? And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Brethren, the half has never yet been told of the glory those words have for us when we really understand them and govern ourselves accordingly. That's fellowship with God. And being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That's what that's saying. Now watch what he goes ahead to say. If we say that we have no sin. In other words, you can't reach a stage where you can say, Well, I made it. I don't have to be particular about anything else. 
I, I don't even commit sins of ignorance or sins of weakness. Paul had something to say about people who think, well, you think you stand by yourself? He that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. You better acknowledge that any sin that you used to habitually commit, that you forsaken when you were baptized into Christ at the point of repentance, or any sin anybody's committing anywhere else, you're fully capable of still doing it. So all your life in the church, one of the marks of soundness is the constant vigilance we have over ourselves to keep ourselves in the love of God. That's my responsibility and yours. And the fellowship we have as brothers and sisters help each other to keep ourselves in the love of God. Brethren, my work as a preacher, as a Christian, your work in whatever capacity you have in the church, but as Christians, one another, is to help everybody else stay in the love of God. To stay in the fellowship of God. To stay faithful to the Lord. Thus our Lord will say, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now who's that for? Those who are in fellowship with God. Those who are in fellowship with everybody else in fellowship with God. And those who die in fellowship with God. The blood cleanses, but we've got to contact it first. And that's when you're baptized into the death of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, when he shed his blood. And thus, when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death, and you're raised to walk in newness of life, added to the church, in fellowship with God, in fellowship with everybody else that's done the same thing. And the blood of Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin as you're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you're a faithful child of God and you have that and understand it, you have something so very few in this world has ever understood or known. You are the elect. You are the royal priesthood. You are children of the Most High. And all that there is from the throne of God in heaven that encompasses all there is about the power and glory and might of heaven and all the angels therein works for you like it doesn't work for anything else because you are a child of your Father in heaven. And if you know in your feeble ways what it means to be a child of your earthly father or your children, then you know that means you're special. And God wants you in heaven with Him. Thus, He's authored a way, a system of grace and mercy that when we get into it, He favors us. It was said as I close this, concerning this fellowship we enjoy through obeying the gospel, God's power to save, and walking by that standard of truth that keeps us in fellowship with God and in fellowship with everybody else who's in fellowship with God. But a very happy gospel preacher, I won't call his name, was walking one morning and he met somebody and he was cheery and whistling. And the person said, well, you're happy today. He says, like you own the world. And the quip was right back, my father does. I suggest you think about that as encouragement when you walk the paths of life with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, wearing the helmet of salvation, and the helmet of salvation going along with the breastplate of righteousness, and so on, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, to fight the fight of faith, to lay hold on eternal life. If you're not a child of God, don't you see, we've studied what the Bible teaches in simple, clear plain language that one must do to become a Christian. If you're a child of God and sinned, then the second law of pardon is to repent of that sin. Confess it and pray God for forgiveness. Rise up and press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things which are behind, do that. So if you're subject to the great invitation of God who says, I want to fellowship you, but you have to submit to the gospel. And when you do, You'll be in a state of favor with me that nobody else has and in fellowship with all those who've done likewise in the great church that is of, by, and for Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father and the salvation of the souls of men.
Are you subject to the great call of our Lord? If so, come while we stand and while we sing.